the longest running show in the West End of Glasgow, my former parliamentary constituency, has finally come to an end. Many world leaders came to COP26. You could tell that by the vapour trails of their private jets, the diesel consumption from their eight-mile-a-gallon cavalcades, and the media hullabaloo. Why this show couldn't have been watched on Zoom, like the ABBA concert, has never been properly explained. Perhaps it was the money, money, money that's involved in the greenwashing of capitalism. But some ghosts haunted the event in their absence. Russia, whose president did appear by Zoom, and China, whose president appeared by old-fashioned printed press handouts. Why so, and wherefore? Our man in Beijing, an American abroad, Tom McGregor, might explain. He joins us now. Tom, thank you for coming on board. Okay. What was with the President Xi's uh, press handout? Why didn't he make a video, at least? Well, he offered to do a video. From what I understand, uh, Biden gave the order that he they were not going to let him go do a video of his speech. This was very childish behavior on the part of the U.S. and perhaps some EU leaders who allowed that to happen. That's very rude. Even, even Putin could do a video, but they tried to make Xi look somewhat less powerful by playing this childish game on him. It's, it's just outrageous. Making him cut down trees to uh, to print the print the statement off, uh, perhaps uh, yeah. there was that in it too. Um, but more seriously, uh, yeah, how does China view this recent preoccupation of developed Western Northern economies uh, with with greenwash uh, after they have already built up their wealth? and sure. taken uh, most of their people out of the direst poverty, at least. Is there a feeling in China, I feel it a bit myself, that people want to take a snapshot of the world as it is now and keep it that way? Uh, the problem being that countries like China, like India and others, uh, have some way to go to catch up. Yeah, exactly. And also, uh, it was very noticeable about a lot of hypocrisy that went on at this uh, Green Conference. You see Biden sleeping. You had other photos of Boris Johnson sleeping. You had quite a few people doing a lot of sleeping during these speeches. And if, supposedly, this is the end of the world, and this is a major crisis that they have to fix right now. Why would they be sleeping? <laughs> I don't know. So obviously, they, the Chinese certainly noticed the sleeping. They noticed a lot of the jets that came in and the, 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 the carbon emissions that probably, who knows, maybe Glasgow was much more polluted this past week uh, in the, in, during the summit than ever before. I mean, it, there was a lot of jets coming in with a lot of uh, carbon pollution going on. And you had, so what, what China noticed was a lot of the hypocrisy and at the same time, yes, it's, it's important you address that issue of the development. The Western uh, developed nations had over 100 years to develop their economy, and they used a lot of coal, they used a lot of oil, a lot of gas, and then suddenly they become rich and they're trying to tell everybody else, well, you can't do what we did. Uh, that's, that's very rich. That's very strange, actually. And, you know, even India sort of noticed this, and Indonesia as well. They had some concerns about some of these demands that were coming out from these rich nations. The uh, coal issue is the one that they get China on, isn't it? China has signed yeah. up to the same targets as other people, uh, but in the interim, they intend to go hell for leather with uh, coal. Uh, why is China so, as it were, uh, addicted to coal? Well, I wouldn't say it's addicted. First of all, you've got to realize that you have 1.4 billion people here, so you have a lot of households. What is the most reliable form of energy and the cheapest? Well, it happens to be coal. Chinese are very good about mining coal, as well as they import a lot of coal. They've, the coal is a big deal. They actually tried to cut down some of their coal spending the past year, and guess what happened? The coal prices zoomed up, 
And then suddenly China had an energy shortage and electricity issues. So the, the fact is, is you cannot fix the coal issue overnight. It takes a lot of time and effort, and it, it's not going to be something in five years, or even 10 years. That's exactly what China had some concerns about. Uh, the U.S. offered no real alternatives in, in response. They just simply said, oh, you have to go cut down your coal. It doesn't work that way with the Chinese. At least you have to negotiate some type of compromise. The U.S. side and a lot of these Western governments made no, no efforts at compromise, and that could explain a major reason for why the Chinese and President Xi was not so excited to be a willing participant of the conference. Now, uh, my sister has got an electric vehicle, which uh, proves very handy as petrol prices are extremely high at the moment, at its highest uh, in, for some time. Sure. Uh, we've got solar panels in our garden, so we're doing okay. our bit, but I believe we're far behind China. China is far more advanced yeah. with electric vehicles, electric buses, and, and solar panels. Exactly. So, and that's what's interesting. Even though China has made a major move to alternative energy with solar, wind, and now they're going to start doing more nuclear power, they still had, uh, without the coal, they had still had major energy sh shortages. So what's happening is, is China is trying to play catch up with its renewable energies, but it's going to take a long time because you have such a huge population here, and many of these cities that have 10 million or more people. So, and what's also interesting is when you, a lot of these uh, solar power, solar cells, are manufactured in Xinjiang because you have a lot of rare earths in Xinjiang. And then suddenly the U.S. and the EU decided they're going to blacklist all of these echo companies in, in Xinjiang. And now what's going to happen? I mean, didn't the, the Western say that they love to have renewables, but most of the rare earths they use come from Xinjiang? This is very strange. I just find it very odd. Well, they do say the Americans don't like Muslims and don't like Chinese, but they love Chinese Muslims. This is, uh, so, yeah. this is uh, a part of the whole Uyghur question, isn't it? There's, uh, yes, there's it is. a renewed offensive uh, on this subject. You know, sometimes it's Tibet, sometimes it's the Uyghurs, sure. sometimes it's Hong Kong, it's Taiwan, yeah. it's Huawei, it's COVID-19, it's Wuhan. Yeah. There's a lot of pieces in this orchestra. Uh, but yeah. for the moment, it's the Uyghur uh, question that is sounding the loudest note. Uh, how does China mm -hmm. feel about that? Well, obviously, they don't see it as a lot of these are exaggerated lies. I mean, they're saying millions and millions of Chinese Muslims are in these re-education camps where they're suffering terrible abuse. But uh, as I said to many people, just focus on the logic. Northwest China is a desert. They have no water. And if they do have water, it's very little. So you're going to say to me that you're opening up all these prison camps where now you have to deploy hundreds of thousands of Chinese prison guards. They can't be hired from Xinjiang because perhaps they might be too nice, according to the conspiracy. So you have to hire Han Chinese prison guards. So then you're going to have to have hundreds of thousands of prison guards in these prison camps to wash over millions of Uyghurs. In other words, what I'm saying is it doesn't make logical sense when they are saying that millions of people are in these re-education camps. It, China did say that maybe 10 or 20,000 at a time are in camps because they were busted on doing some type of terrorism or they had friends who were somehow connected to terrorism. But this idea of millions, that's outrageous. It's not happening. China is the second biggest economy in the world. Uh, at some point, within 5, 10, 15 years, it's going to be the biggest economy in the world. Uh, it has uh, the world's biggest army. Uh, and this issue of the role of armaments and war in uh, the environmental depredation is something that was quite missing uh, at COP in Glasgow. Several of the leaders there are risking nuclear war uh, with China in the South China Sea, over Taiwan, 
over contested islands, nothing could be more ruinous for the environment than the preparations for and the execution of military conflict. Am I right? I totally agree with you. And, and you know, sometimes, George, you and I don't always agree, but one thing you and I are very strong on is peace and to try to avoid war, uh, uh, whatever you can to avoid war. And a lot of times what's going on right now with the U.S. and the EU and, and the U.K. as well is they're sending these ships, sail around Taiwan. I mean, it's, it's starting to get a little bit messy, and it's a little bit scary, to be honest. It, 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 I have not seen it at this level before, even when it was under Trump or the Obama administration. They are rationing up tensions. They are sending a lot of the naval fleets to sail around areas that are very close to Chinese water. And I had also noted, I had also today read a uh, article from Xinjiang today. They apparently said that there was a Taiwan jet that tried to flow, fly into Chinese aerospace and the PLA jet had to escort it away from its air, uh, airspace. This is getting some very scary times. Last question, President Xi, did he boycott COP26? Uh, or were there just practical reasons for him not going? Well, it's a good and fair question to ask. Uh, it, it's obvious that even if he had shown up, he probably would have been insulted. Would they even give him a time to give a speech? They didn't even let him send a video of his speech. They're acting very childish. So I suspect that G was, was assuming that he was going to be poorly treated at the conference and decided it's not worth going. Tom McGregor, thanks for joining us on board the Sputnik. Thank you.